seperti laku dan fungsi otak lainnya. Satu dari 10 orang yang berusia di atas 65 tahun mengidap Alzheimer. Setiap 3 detik, ada satu orang terdiagnosa Alzheimer di dunia. Alzheimer belum bisa disembuhkan. Obat yang ada hanya untuk memperlambat progresivitas dan mengatasi gejala Alzheimer. Kurangilah risiko terkena Alzheimer, kenali 10 gejala umum penyakit Alzheimer. Gangguan daya ingat Pak, anak-anak nanti jadi pulang kan? Jadi? Pak, anak-anak jadi pulang kan ya? Kok tanya lagi? Kan barusan sudah dijawab, Bu. Sering lupa akan kejadian yang baru saja terjadi, menceritakan dan menanyakan hal yang sama berulang-ulang, lupa akan satu hal dalam frekuensi yang terlalu sering. Sulit fokus Halo? Halo? Ah, ini telepon udah rusak mungkin ya. Kok nggak bisa dipakai? Melakukan hal yang biasa dan sederhana menjadi lebih susah dan perlu waktu lama. Sulit melakukan kegiatan sehari-hari. Dari tadi nulis perencanaan keuangannya, kok nggak selesai-selesai, Bu? Seringkali sulit untuk merencanakan atau menyelesaikan tugas sehari-hari. Bingung cara mengatur keuangan, bahkan bingung cara mengemudi. Disorientasi waktu Anterin ibu yuk Mau kemana jam 10 malam begini bu? Ke pasar Disorientasi tempat Bingung akan waktu di mana mereka berada dan tidak tahu jalan pulang Susah memahami visual spasial Ayo pak pulang Ini cara keluarnya gimana ya? Bu, kok tumpah-tumpah dibiarkan? Hah? Tumpah? Apanya? Kesulitan memahami visual spasial dapat kita lihat dari kesulitan mengukur jarak, membedakan warna, tidak mengenali wajah sendiri di cermin, menabrak cermin atau pintu kaca ketika berjalan, serta kesulitan mencari jalan keluar yang sebelumnya dilalui. Gangguan berkomunikasi Pak, Tolong ambilin itu, um, apa namanya, um, itu loh, um, jam dinding ibu di... Maksud ibu, jam tangan. Iya, iya, jam tangan. Gangguan berkomunikasi dapat kita lihat dari kesulitan berbicara dan mencari kata yang tepat di dalam sebuah percakapan, serta bingung untuk melanjutkannya. Menaruh barang tidak pada tempatnya. Pasti kamu ya, Udin, yang ambil dompet. Tidak, Nyonya. Sumpah. Menyimpan barang tidak pada tempatnya, bahkan kadang curiga ada yang mencuri atau menyembunyikan barang tersebut, sehingga berdampak terhadap orang-orang di sekitarnya. Salah membuat keputusan. Ini, Mas, uangnya. Loh, kebanyakan, Bu. Belanjaan Ibu cuma 20000 ribu aja. Salah membuat keputusan meliputi bingung menentukan suatu hal, susah menghitung, berpakaian tidak serasi atau terbalik, dan lain sebagainya. Menarik diri dari pergaulan. Ibu kok di sini sih? Nggak ikut kumpul barang aja di luar. Ah, nggak apa-apa, Pak. Enakan di sini. Nggak usah, di sini aja. Menarik diri dari pergaulan dengan atau tanpa alasan yang jelas, tidak memiliki inisiatif untuk melakukan aktivitas yang biasa dinikmati, cenderung diam saja dengan mata menerawang. Perubahan perilaku dan kepribadian Masakan ibu agak asin ya? Ah gitu ya, dulu aja bilangnya enak, sekarang bilangnya asin. Bapak udah nggak cinta lagi ya sama ibu. Uh, serba salah semuanya. Orang berubah menjadi lebih sensitif, mudah tersinggung. Hal kecil dapat memicu kemarahan yang meledak-ledak yang berlebihan. Iritabilitas, depresi, mudah kecewa, dan putus asa. 
Apabila Anda melihat adanya 10 gejala Alzheimer ini, tindakan selanjutnya adalah memeriksakan ke dokter, meminta untuk diberikan deteksi dini serta pemeriksaan lebih lanjut, bergabung dengan komunitas peduli Alzheimer di lingkungan Anda. Tindakan mengurangi risiko terkena Alzheimer diantaranya adalah melakukan olahraga teratur, menerapkan pola makan yang sehat mengkonsumsi gizi seimbang, melatih otak secara berkala, berpikiran positif, dan beraktivitas produktif. Hubungi Alzheimer Indonesia jika salah satu keluarga atau di lingkungan terdekat Anda ada yang mengalami ciri-ciri dari 10 gejala demensia Alzheimer. Jangan maklum dengan pikun. Lupa, kehilangan daya ingat bukanlah bagian normal dari penuaan. again in Alzheimer Indonesia, a Netherlands online sessions. It's um, really, really happy to see you all my um, familiar faces is here. I'm, I'm really happy because it's been like more than 20 sessions already and we are still there. And um, yeah, and we are coming to the end of actually this is our Alzheimer Indonesia Netherlands Indonesian month. Um, it's like before uh, because in August it's uh, Indonesian Independence Day and then we usually we celebrate anything related to Indonesia in this month. We have um, uh, language Bahasa Indonesia, we have cooking lesson la last week uh, with the pastages market, it's in Dutch uh, last week. Yeah, and then also uh, we have several um, activity already this August and this is the last activity of our Indonesia month. Uh, 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 now and then um, thank you for being here and yeah like I said we have uh, several activities and um, and now uh, as usual uh, okay for those who don't doesn't know uh, I'm Amalia chair of Alzheimer Indonesia uh, Netherlands and I think um, now I have uh, two of my good colleagues and also friends from Alzheimer Indonesia Netherlands science team uh, Eva and Tania will be introduced themselves and then leading the sessions uh, later and of course, as usual, <laughs> hopefully, if you are um, at least once a week, if you are always here, um, we will always start with the brain gym. And so um, let's start with the brain gym and I will let Eva and Tania uh, starting the sessions now. So let's start. It's really easy. It's balancing your left and your right brain with a simple exercise. This is music from Andy Rianto and also the risk reduction team from Alzheimer Indonesia in Jakarta.
I will, I will let some participants uh, coming in. So uh, we have Alzheimer Indonesia chapter managers here. We have some volunteers and we have also um, diaspora from the Netherlands. And also we have uh, people with dementia here. There is Oma Lalita and also the caregivers, uh, Gao family, Nofi and Devi. So it's pretty um, um, complete today. Now, yes. Um, now I think I will give the screen to Eva and Tania. So Eva, you may introduce yourself and start the sessions. Enjoy the sessions. Thank you so much, Amalia. And uh, from the Indonesian woman in the Netherlands, we go to the <laughs> Dutch woman in Indonesia. A very warm welcome to everyone and thanks for joining today. I'll just be the moderator for a little bit. And uh, well, as you may have noticed, even up until now, we've had so many different types of music already in this session. Uh, music is everywhere, isn't it? Just a very brief introduction of myself. Um, I have a PhD in public health, but I work mainly in dementia care. And I specialize in non-pharmacological intervention to make the life of people living with dementia a bit or a lot better. And one of the things I do is the Montessori methodology. I'm not going to explain it, but a big part of it is using music that that particular person likes uh, to listen to, to sing to, to dance to, to clap to, whatever their abilities are. Uh, I think for the moment that's more than enough about me. Uh, just some uh, domestic comments. Uh, please ask any clarifying questions to Tanya during the session. So if anything's not clear in her presentation, please put up your hand and uh, wait for Tanya to give you a sign or me to respond, uh, to ask the question. Any other questions, please save them for after the talk. Or if you like, you can type them into the chat box and I will note them down as well. Uh, entirely up to you, it should all be fine. And if you do type in the chat box, please also put your name, of course, it will be there, but also your background. So what perspective are you coming from? Uh, asking this question, maybe you're a family caregiver um, or a professional caregiver. So please give me that information. So uh, that would help Tanya and me to answer your question as uh, is helpful for you. So let me introduce Dr. Tanya Setiadi. Excuse me, I was going to do it right. <laughs> um, she has done a master's thesis uh, at Udayama University here in Bali in 2014 on gamelan and cognitive function. And she'll be talking about that a little bit. Uh, and at this moment in time, she is the science coordinator of Alzheimer Nederland, Indonesia, Nederland. And she's finishing up, very close to finishing up her PhD in Groningen uh, in cognitive neuroscience. So I'll give the floor to Tanya and I will be back with you later. Enjoy. Thank you, Eva, for the introduction. I will try to share my screen now. Okay, can you see my screen now? Is it okay? Yes. Cool. So um, thank you, Amalia. Thank you, Eva, for the introduction. Hi, everyone. Good morning from the Netherlands and then good afternoon in Indonesia. And I think that's all. I want to welcome you all to the 23rd um, RCNet online session. And then today, since this is still August, the uh, Independence Month, um, Indonesian Independence Month, so we will talk about benefits of music for older adults, especially in Indonesia. So our population is aging. So globally, the population aged 65 years old and over is growing faster than all other age groups. So um, by 2050, one in six people in the world um, is going to be over um, age 65 years old. But how about in Indonesia? Here, Indonesia amongst um, the other countries, 
So in Indonesia also, it's expected to be um, like in 2030, um, it's predicted um, the elderly number is going to be around 13%. So uh, what does this mean? In regard of this, for the past two decades, um, a large number of studies has tried to find answers of how every person in every country in the world can have an opportunity to live a long, happy and healthy life. So this led me to a question, um, what can be a potential factor to reach um, healthy aging, especially in Indonesia? So in his book, Musicophilia, Oliver Sacks, um, he's a neuroscientist, neurologist and neuroscientist, mentioned that one does not need to have any formal knowledge of music nor indeed to be particularly musical to enjoy music and to respond to it at the deepest level. So um, music is part of the human, uh, being human, and there is no human culture, um, which is not highly developed in esteem. So this statement is really intriguing for me. So it might support the notion that music may play um, an important role in the society, no matter what is the cultural background. So music is for everyone. So, um, in Indonesia, a diverse number of traditional music instruments existed across um, the island. Now, I want to um, ask you a question. Um, can you guess how many um, traditional music instruments exist in Indonesia? Just give a smart guess and then you can type something in the chat box. I was curious about it. Like, how many instruments do you think that we have in Indonesia? Okay. I cannot see the chat box now here. Yeah. Oops, I'm oh, sorry. How can I, I cannot see the chat box here. Oh, how to see this. Okay, so uh, there's one answer. Um, can you guess? Any guess? Okay, so. 100. Um, 100. What? 100, 100. yeah, 100. <laughs> Okay, so I already give you the answer. So according um, to the data from the Indonesian Ministry of Education and Culture, at least we have um, 232 traditional music instruments across Indonesia. So I don't know whether you, you can recognize um, these different um, music instruments in here. Perhaps in the Netherlands, um, it's more common um, of Anklung or Gamelan, but in here we have Sasando from Nusa Tenggara and we have Tifa from Papua. So there are a lot of um, a number of um, musical instruments, different musical instruments that existed in Indonesia. So what does this tell us? Because music instruments are so visible in most islands in Indonesia. We can see here it's from Sumatra, Java, Sulawesi, Kalimantan, Maluku, and Papua, and Bali, and Nusa Tenggara. So I think it is more likely that music play a big role in the society. So today, I will specifically talk about Gong Kebiar Gamelan. So it is a traditional Balinese music ensemble, which has been the most popular performance in Bali since 1915. So before we start to discuss more about Gong Kebiar Gamelan and the elderly, um, let me introduce you with this amazing ensemble uh, while watching the performance of um, the elderly group, uh, elderly musician in Denpasar, which performed in 2014 to um, celebrate 100,000 of uh, 100 years, sorry, 100 years of Gong Kebiar Gamelan. So enjoy this.
dihormati sebagai penampilan pertama Sekegol Warda Santi Seniman Lansia Kota Denpasar Akan mempersembahkan tabuh kebiar jaya semara Kita sambut dengan tepuk tangan yang meriah Inilah tabuh kebiar jaya semara Gamelan is the most popular um, style of or genre of the Balinese Gamelan. 
it has been the heart of Balinese lifestyle, not only as a leisure activities, but also as a religious performance. So um, it can be played by people of all ages. Usually they start to practice gamelan since they were very young. And then so it can be a played from the children age to older adults. And gamelan music actually a musical activity can easily be found in Balinese community as each banjar, as Bali banjar or uh, Balinese community hall mostly has a set of gamelan instruments. Um, and then here, what is the meaning of the word kebiar in here? Because in Bali, um, we have like so many different um, gamelan instruments, but kebiar means um, to flare up to, or to burst open. So you can hear if you watch the video, um, just now, we can feel the explosive changes in tempo and it's very dynamic. It's really different compared to um, other gamelan type, like for example, the Javanese gamelan, which is very calm and more relaxing. But for Balinese gamelan, it's more dynamic. And this gamelan uh, based on the five tone scale. So um, here, um, playing gamelan, we know we, if we watch the video just now, we can see the intense and then it's involved multi-sensory and then also involved motoric experience. So it showed uh, physical um, activities. So how to, to practice, how to hit the metallophone. It's really um, tiring as well. And then playing gamelan also evokes spirits and yeah, yeah. become uh, an essential part of uh, modern Bali Hindu ceremonies. And then it's, uh, for example, the annual birthday ceremonies for temples or odalan, or as accompaniment for the sacred um, dances. So playing gamelan at the temple, it really means to give um, the best offerings to God um, through music or dancing. So I think this is also the difference between um, Indonesian culture, especially for gamelan, the Eastern culture, because it's not merely about music. It's also um, it involves spiritual um, feelings because it's some um, offering for um, God. Moreover, uh, while many researchers also believe that playing um, music um, it plays a significant role in strengthening um, social bond, I do believe that playing gamelan are mostly affecting social abilities and impacting our ability to connect with one another through this mechanism. So um, here are the several mechanisms. I think I already presented this um, on yeah, a couple of months ago and um, music um, webinar as well. So here are the several mechanisms that enable um, music um, to strengthen the social bonds. So the seven C's we know. So first contact. Playing gamelan is a group activity. They come into contact with, it, with each other. So the elderly people usually were excited to meet their friends when they have to practice gamelan. And then the second one is um, coordination. Uh, compared to Western music um, or classical music, uh, um, play, um, gamelan players need to memorize, need to memorize and then each individual re is required to synchronize to a beat and then to keep a beat. So it's not, we don't have any musical scores here to, um, to play um, the music. So it's, you really need to make a good coordination one another. The next one is Kopati. So as mentioned earlier, while playing for a ceremony at the temple, there is a strong congruency of feelings of one another and then social cognition while the player can um, feel or can imagine what is the um, meaning of the song, um, why the composer create the song. And then also um, communication, and then the music is one way of communicating belonging. You can see from the clip before they make a gesture, a body gesture, and then like eye gesture um, to one another. How to like, okay, like, okay, when, let's give a code, um, kind of like a code when to start. So it's like, it's, it's a really nice um, example, I mean, for the gamelan. And then cooperation. Of course, this gamelan performance involves cooperation between players, when to hit the keys or when to stop. And then the last one, um, as an effect, this gamelan activity leads to increased social cohesion of a group. 
And then this is the thing that I'm missing um, during the pandemic. So a um, couple um, of weeks ago, I, um, yeah, I had an interview with the Gamelan um, composer, and then he's uh, also a mentor instructor of the elderly group. Since the pandemic, um, the elderly cannot gather um, to practice together. So this is, um, they are they're really missing this moment to gather um, and then to practice and then to perform at the temple because they are not allowed currently until we don't know when. So this really affect them. Like they really feel um, a bit isolated because they cannot um, practice and they cannot meet each other to practice gamelan. So the last function is um, cognition. So it's, um, this is the, um, how about the association between uh, playing gamelan and cognitive functioning. It has remained unclear uh, whether Indonesian traditional music is related to cognitive function. Therefore, in order to bring this, um, our Eastern culture to be studied scientifically, in 2014, I conducted a research of 100 uh, healthy elderly in uh, Sukawati, Gianya region, Bali, that aim to investigate the cognitive function differences between Baliness uh, elderly with and without gamelan musical activity. So 100 healthy elderly, um, all male, all healthy, were divided into two groups. Um, one group with, uh, one group is a musician and then the other group a non-musician. And then from the table here, we can see it's interestingly, so in the musician group, mostly, so almost ninety percent of the musician already practice gamelan for more than ten years. So in Bali, it's um, the root is really strong, also the culture. So usually they start early um, in the younger age, and then they keep playing it until the later age. And then although 58% um, of the musician already um, stopped um, playing now, but um, yeah, it's amazing to see like how long they already practice here. And then the result is the musician group uh, showed uh, a better co general cognitive functioning compared to the non-musician. So, um, and then in group one or the musician group, those who currently still playing gamelan had still had a better um, cognitive, um, general cognitive functioning compared to those who already stopped playing. And then here, uh, the last one is like the take home messages. So music is pleasing uh, and then it's free, it's harmless and then it's universal. I will like, and then you can see here in the, it's very different from the Western um, music or yeah, classical music in the Western society, but um, yeah, it's still um, pleasing. And then listening, playing, or creating music may be beneficial for older adults in various aspects. We can see from emotional, social, physical, and also uh, for motoric. And then the ability and the need to engage in this social functioning that makes us human. Uh, and then the emotional effects of engaging in these functions include experience of reward, fun, joy, and happiness. So perhaps in Indonesia, um, they don't expect to be to have like a better cognitive function or to be smart when they start to play music in here in Bali, especially when they start to um, they play music in their younger age, they don't think about um, yeah, this music activity can will make them like smart or will um, protect them from um, dementia. No, they are, I think they're really simple and then they just do it um, because of the society, because of this is a culture, the tradition, and then this is also more religious matters for more religious purpose. So this is um, another example, just um, this is a group of uh, women. So mostly like in the um, long time ago, um, all gamelan players are mostly male. But here um, lately, the, we have um, like women, um, group and then they start to also have their own group of, of um, women um, gamelan music. So this is um, different um, gamelan. This is not the gong kebiar. The gong kebiar is very dynamic but this is more gong angklung so it's, I will just um, show this just a bit. <laughs> So yeah, 
Thank you very much for your attention. Um, it's really um, brief, but I just want to, to I want to introduce you music from Indonesia. And then because next week also we have um, next month um, we have um, another session about music, and it is really um, interesting for me. So this is also, yeah, we will look forward to um, have a discussion, and then perhaps you can share from your experience, whether you have um, experience, yeah, I don't know, in um, Gamelan, playing Gamelan, or I, see, I think I see some comments here in the chat box. Oh, it's really nice. Um, okay. So I think we can just start with a discussion. Uh, I will just stop sharing now. Okay. Okay, Tanya, thank you so much for your presentation. I actually woke up to Gamelan. Not, I didn't wake up because of the Gamelan music, but when I was awake this morning, I did hear it in the distance. A uh, very peaceful sound this morning. Sometimes it's a bit more uh, activating. Um, let me start by inviting Ignace, who sent us some uh, questions before the meeting. Ignace, are you either okay to ask the questions yourself or could you let me know the background you're coming from in the chat so we have a little bit more of an idea where your beautiful questions are coming from. And if you'd like to ask them yourself, please unmute yourself and join the conversation. Okay, I'll start with Ignace's first question, and I know there's other people in the, in the audience. We also may like to chip in to reply to her questions. The first question is, do I have to be a certified music therapist to apply music therapy? So, um, in my opinion, so we have a music therapist in here, um, Monique, and perhaps you can add something, because I'm not a music therapist uh, myself, so I'm a more in a researcher who is like, very curious about what music affects us. But uh, for me, in my opinion, yes, if you want to give like an intervention, I think it's better that you are um, a music therapist, or I think you, at least you have a guidance from the music therapist if you want to give the intervention, like, yeah, program intervention, because um, in here we have to def um, divide um, like music when we have music as an intervention or music as a mu past history. So we can um, search, um, do the research from yeah, many ways, I think. But for that question, I think it's better if you are a music therapist, so you can give like, a, yeah, a certain, formula or to treat people. Monique, perhaps you can add something. We yes. have a music therapist in here. Hi. <laughs> <clears throat> That's a very good question and it's the most asked question actually that I get all the time. So the question is, do I need to be a certified music therapist to, to uh, make music or put gamelan? And the answer is not not a simple yes or no. The answer is it all depends on the reason or the goal you are doing your music, uh, setting your music. If it's like a, a very nice activity that you want to do with your, uh, with your family member that has dementia or with a group of, uh, of uh, the mental elderly, then uh, you don't need to be a music therapist per se to have them a good time. And you know, it's all about quality of life and and, and, and sharing a nice moment. So no, you don't have to be a music uh, therapist, but as soon as there is more involved than just, uh, you know, just an activity or an, uh, 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 something to, to just enjoy together, if things are coming up during the music, then yes, you definitely have to at least collaborate with a music therapist or uh, yes, have a music uh, therapist involved because, um, there can be a lot of things going on while the music is playing. So you need to really be, uh, be sensitive for that. Would you have an example for us of, of what you may see and how you as a music therapist would respond? Yes, for instance, um, 
um, I work a lot with, uh, with people, um, uh, Dutch people, but also people from the former Dutch Indies. And uh, when I play gamelan or, uh, or I, I get the, the anklungs out or I listen to uh, gamelan music, you will see some people getting uh, memories, of course, because the music uh, uh, evokes the memories coming on. And uh, obviously, they, they are not always good memories. I mean, uh, of course, sometimes it's really joyful and everything, but depending, and that's Tanya, I compliment you on giving us the difference about Gamelan and Yafa, joyful, but also, you know, in, in uh, Bali, uh, where it really explodes. Well. In the, in the session or in the music, it can explode. I mean, the music can trigger the emotions to explode. So when, when then all of a sudden uh, a joyful get together turns into a uh, kind of a traumatic experience of the people, then of course you need to, uh, to uh, act right away, either to uh, give this person uh, individual contact or uh, well, let it happen or, and, well, uh, the bottom line is then, yes, then it, you have to have therapeutic background and, 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 and psychosocial background and cognitive background to, yeah, to guide it, so to speak. And this happens a lot in, in sessions because music is emotion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Very clear answer. Thank you. And maybe I can take the opportunity if people are really interested in, in getting a little bit deeper into the therapeutic part of music. Um, I'm, I'm so happy to invite you uh, on the 12th of September because that's about the power of music in music therapy. And uh, I don't want to take all the time for Tania's beautiful webinar. So please, if you want to hear more about that, come join us on the 12th of September. Thank you so much, Monique. And I'm sure people will uh, already be inspired to listen to you as well. Did anybody, I think that really answered the first question, did anybody want to, to follow up from there or shall I move to the next question? Yeah, so the next question was, how do I choose the right song for the right individual? And if Tanya doesn't mind, I, uh, I'm happy to also chip in here because we, um, when I was working in Australia, we worked with people with very advanced dementia. You have to uh, consider people with MMSE approaching zero. And as our informants, we would have both family carers and professional carers. But that only tells you that much. That basically tells you where to start, which songs and artists to try first. And then you'll be led by the person with dementia. And uh, as we know, they're very good exp at expressing or showing their emotions. So, you know, within a couple of seconds, you know if you uh, choose the right song or not. And for us, it worked to really prepare a lot of different songs and being able to switch very quickly um, from there. So to really see the response is not that good, let's move on quickly, or hey, this song we can actually repeat again. Tanya, would you have something to add to that? Yeah, I think it's really personalized, right? Like, I mean, by your experience as well, and then uh, by the journal that I read, it's, um, we cannot ask like to say, okay, it's better to use classical music or jazz music um, for um, people with dementia or for the therapy. Because I believe that people have their own preferences, their different preferences. So it's really need, um, even if we ask the family member, for, for example, for the family member, okay, like the, what song um, did your mother like or before? And then it's still very limited, right? It's still, yeah. And I'm very agree with you that we have to like prepare um, different kind of music. Because we never know, perhaps, um, yeah, one person like um, Jess more than one person like Gamelan more than either. So it's, it's very personalized, I think, for people. So we have to be, um, yeah, we have to be more open to custom, customize. Yeah, Monique have um, something to add. Yes. Um, um... Yes, it's, uh, it's uh, both what Tanya, what you and what Eva says is correct. Uh, I just want to share with the audience a rule of thumb. If you have the, 
uh, the ways um, of finding out uh, what music, of course, uh, the, the person likes, uh, because it's, it is very, uh, very person-to-person uh, -person individualized. But the rule of thumb is if uh, between the 15th and the 25th year of the life, it's what they call the blueprint. The blueprint of the musical preferences in the brain is kind of blueprinted in the brain. So you are very safe to use the music that was important in that decade of their life. It's just a rule of thumb. It's not a golden shot, but then you have at least some some trigger points to start with if you really have no idea. And of course the background and, and uh, uh, the, the religion and uh, where they grew up, etc. cetera. So uh, yeah, it is kind of a try and error thing or an, a, a journey to find out what music they like, but it is very important to personalize the music, that's for sure. Yeah, now I remember one question because I gave uh, one seminar and then somebody asked me. So it's between 15 and 25 years old, right? So if a person came to you and it is on the pretty late stage and then the family member doesn't, uh, doesn't know um, like what music preferences that somebody has, like or the family member has, so we can just adjust, like think about the popular music during that era or uh, like we can count from the age right like but what, what, what yes we have any mm. yes like i said that is an, an uh it is a good starting point uh when they were teenagers when they were adults you know adolescents mm -hmm. that would be a good starting point but also uh during the stages of dementia people can completely completely change also their music preferences. I have had clients that uh, were only uh, into classical music or jazz music. So the, the family member said, oh, never put any folk music on because daddy hates it. But then it turns out that he was the biggest fan of, you know, uh, any type of folk music. Uh, and then the, the, the family member said, oh, we didn't know that daddy likes that as well. So yes, in the dementia process, they can, they can change. So yeah, it comes down sometimes to just try and error and you find out if they don't or do like the music. So, but yes, uh, it is uh, safe to uh, use their music from their youth or even when they were really, really young. I always sing children's songs and lullabies because you, we all know with dementia, they, the memory rolls back a lot mm -hmm. of times into their early childhood, so. Oh, interesting to know that, thank you very much. <laughs> just just to follow from there um just wanted to show everyone this book it's called singing in the brain i'm sorry about the the and it's by a dutch professor erik scherder and um he asked a question a bit further on in the book like does your preference for music change during your life so that's the connection with what monique said uh and interestingly, I will try to keep it short. He, he quotes one study that said, uh, had study participants aged between 13 and 65. Um, and this is what happens. And you have to imagine this is probably a Dutch based or European based study. So I'm really interested what, what Indonesian or Indo people think about this. But he says on average, they found 18 years old, listened for 25 hours per week to music. And this then decreased to 12 hours when they're uh, 65 plus. 41% of the youngsters was very passionate about music and only 15 of the elderly people, 15% only. And the opposite was that uh, only very little of the young people uh, found that music didn't have a significance for them. Whereas almost half of the 65 years old went, mm, well, music, you know, not that important and to really follow on from Monique's uh, the interest of the type of music changed with age so the interest for rock and punk and rap and Airbnb steeply declines when people become elderly whereas uh, they become more interested in pop country jazz and classical music um, you know it's all a very general so again uh, as we said before you know personalized uh, is the best but these are the trends we see in yes. this particular study does anybody want to respond to 
all we said. I did see Mary's hand go up, but maybe that was just in the recognizing what Monique said. Yeah, yeah. Did anybody want to follow on what we've just shared? No, just an, uh, a final comment, maybe. Uh, again, uh, I don't want to take all the time of, uh, of Tanya. The bottom line, I guess, is there is no such thing as if the elderly is uh, very agitated, play Mozart. If he is very uh, sad, play Chopin or jazz. There is no such thing. It's mm -hmm. not like music, medicine, like pills. Uh, so yeah, you have to try, try and find out. Great. Okay, yeah, we'll I move on. Oh, I sorry, Tanya. Something a bit because it's also I think um, it's also applicable to elderly, like in Indonesia, for um, particularly in Bali. Like they already played gamelan, they know the music that they know. Like even though now we have internet here, then we can listen to other kind of music. But the music that they know and they feel good about it, it's only like gamelan. It's very specific, I think. So it's. Yeah, it's it's very interesting to explore more. Perhaps we can um, yeah do yeah. something about it later. <laughs> that's correct because that's why I use gamelan with the elderly from the former Dutch Indies as well because this is bringing them back to once they were there. So that's good. Yes, you are correct. Yeah. Great. Great. Okay, we have more and more questions coming in, so I'm moving on. Uh, I'll come back to Igna's questions. There's two more, but for now, Devianti is asking Tanya, what's the difference between Gamalan and Golintan? So uh, it's uh, different. Um, so it's different and instrument because Gamalan is a, a set of it's an ensemble, and then Golintan is um, it's same. It's metallophone, like the type is um, um, the same. So it's um, idiophone, so the sound came out from the material that we have to hit the, um, the we have to strike the metals, but it, it came from different area, um, different parts of Indonesia as well. So Kolintang is from Sulawesi, and then Gamelan, we have Gamelan, Javanese Gamelan, also Balinese Gamelan, and then it's a set, so it's, um, it's not only the, like for um, Gongkabia, it's now, looks like similar, like Kolintang, we call it Gangsa. But we have other things, we have changes, we have like some, so many other things. So Gamlan is like a set of um, instruments. So, um, and then Kolintang is only one. And then it came from different um, area of um, Indonesia. But it's the sound is pretty similar with the Gangsa. I hope it answers your question, Defianti. Um, Please follow up in the, in the chat or uh, unmute yourself if you would have additional questions. Okay, I will just go. Um... And I see a question from Marianne and she's asking, uh, do we know of research results uh, about the differences between Western and Eastern music? Uh, so, as far as I know, it's um, not comparable, um, like it's, um, I, I don't know whether they have a study that compare like literally like Eastern music and then Western music, because um, the one that I know is like a study that compare um, different types of music, like jazz versus rock versus classical music. But to say for Eastern and Western music and then how it affects um, yeah, people, the elderly, Today, I don't think, um, yeah, but I, I can make that um, more, but I, I, I don't remember that the particular study. Yeah, I, I think from what the results I just read out that, you know, the young have such a bigger passion and this is not scientific for me, but my impression is that in Indonesia, it's much, much more equal across the generation. It's a community thing. People may, like you said in your presentation, people may start young, but they really continue into old age. Um, do you think that would be a difference? So we're not talking scientifically, but just based on our impression? So I think um, 
it's because of music, you can listen to music, you can play music, you can create music. So it's really different as well between um, like you are like a musician, like professional musician, or you're amateur musician, or you're just musician by nature, like um, you are just singing in a bathroom, for example. Because if you are like a professional musician, usually it takes like a long time, like um, many years to be focused on one or two instruments. So I think like the preference also will be like more specific. But if it's like an um, amateur musician, okay, perhaps you can join like, um, you start with classical music, you start with um, learning piano and then and your teenager age, you start play band, and then like yeah, just try different kind of thing. But um, I agree with you. Um, for the younger generation, I think it will be more similar across the globe now because of the um, yeah the influence of internet. It's like okay, like um yeah, famous singer from uh, the U.S. Let's say it yeah, we also know it here. So. Um, So it's from uh, Devi again. So perhaps my answer is not clear enough. Uh, is there a difference between gamelan music and uh, kalintang music? Uh, do you mean the melody or the effect on people? Or because it's um two different instruments. And then if you ask whether like um, is it the difference is um about the uh, oh, the melody. Okay, so um, yeah, compare. Um, it's similar because um, if um, we see gamelan is like it's um mostly uh is dominated by the gangsa. So it's like the um, the gangsa who plays the melody. So it's um it's similar, but there are still um differences between uh yeah gamelan and kolintang, as I say, because kolintang is a single um single instrument and then gamelan is a set of instruments so we have we can hear the gongs we can hear the like the cheng cheng or like the cymbals um in between so um yeah and then like the from different um part of um, the island we have like a some specific characteristic from like from like for example bali is a gong kebiar and then gong angklung the one that i played um before Go Anklung is more soothing, is more calming, but Gong Kambiar is like very, um, yeah, exploding, like it's, um, it's very loud as well. But for Kolintang, perhaps it's um, more similar to the other one. I hope it's uh, pretty clear for you, Devi. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, do let us know, Devi, if you uh, have follow up question from there. Ah, yeah, all okay. good. <laughs> um, moving back to Ignis questions, and please, anyone else, uh, if you have questions, do type them in the chat. Ignis is also asking, so we're going back to the topic of music therapy, uh, how long before you would see results? Uh, the results of the music therapy, the one from the study that I read that they gave the intervention of uh, like, keyboard, individual uh, piano intervention and using keyboard to elderly who has a musical background and then so and then for the control elderly who never play music on before so they can see the results, the different of the results after six months. So I can remember um, like it's not on top of my head but they have like um, certain program as well so um, three hours practice, I guess, per day. So it's pretty intense, but it's for, um, yeah, the, the post-test is after six months. But I think it really depends on the intensity and then the frequency of the, of the program. Yeah, that, that was exactly her next question. How often would I do this? <laughs> okay, so uh, from, the study, okay, like um, for example, from the study, uh, from my study in Gamelan, they only practice once a week, and then um, it's only for two, um, like twice a year. So it's 
usually they only practice like for um, like a uh, intensive practice for two weeks and then um, before some occasion but for like the regular uh, practice um, it's like only once a week in the banjar usually and then but they do it for a long period of time of course so we can see the difference between um, yeah it's not only for one year or two years like for when what we so before is they practice um, mostly more than 10 years. Yes, Moni. Yes, um, again, uh, it all depends so much on the stage of dementia and on uh, the, what, uh, what uh, goal you have with the music therapy. So yes, in the ideal world, uh, if you dare money and time is not an issue, you want to do it as much as possible, not just once a week and, and maybe 30 minutes or an hour. Sometimes you have results right in the first session and sometimes it takes months. It's, there's no broad answer. Or the, the, the answer is broad. It all depends. So <laughs> yes, you are right. Yeah, yeah, what I meant is it's like for my case, it's healthy elderly. So it's even different okay. from the, right? So it's yes. like healthy elderly. And I can yeah. imagine for the people with dementia. So there are like various stages of dementia. And I can imagine yeah, people yeah. with dementia, if you give like the intervention of music, sometimes they want to do it or perhaps most of the time they don't want to do it. Right? Yeah. Oh yes, Tanya. I apologize. I was thinking dementia, and you were thinking health. <laughs> so, yes, but so, it's nice. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think because my experience is with very severe dementia, I again really uh, agree with Monique how, how personalized it is, and I was the witness of uh, listening uh, to the favorite song of a man with again very advanced dementia and he used to be a singer uh, i'm not sure if it was professional but he loved singing and uh, i was the observer of him for the uh, purposes of the study and um, he listened to the song and he wanted to repeat it so he was leading and i remember when his session was actually finished he started walking around again but in quite a peaceful way and he started singing out really loud the song we had listened to in this beautiful voice. So it was almost instant response. But I think one of, um, regardless of this particular person, for the people who lived in this particular facility, there was so little input and even less personalized input that, you know, when his favorite song was played, it went straight into his implicit memory. He knew the song, he could sing it, he, he just did it. But yeah, it's such a different level of what you're talking about, Tanya. Uh, you know, it's the almost at the other end of the spectrum. And then this was again, just one person, whereas others took much longer. They would always listen with attention, I can say that. Um, but to start singing or clapping, uh, it may never happen. It may take a while. Um, so yeah, I think where Monique and I come from, it's very, very personalized. Uh, how often you would do this and how long it would take to see some response. Yeah, it's really interesting to see the diverse um, yeah, stage of people where they can, yeah, where we can give the intervention or like their musical background. And Monique, yes, indeed. I used to play that Henry Alive Inside on my presentation like beforehand. <laughs> so I always play that because it's really beautiful. Indeed, I really agree that it's really beautiful. Uh, yeah, you can find in the YouTube like Henry Alive Inside. So it's like for the, how music can evoke the memory. Or it's beautiful. And uh, for Ignis, yeah, you can send me an email. Yeah, I will share the email later and then I can email you um, about, yeah, you can send me email then. So um, yeah, it's really a nice discussion. I really enjoy it. So like, yeah, just sharing and then, yeah, with different uh, background, cultural background. But I think, um, the one thing is, um, yeah, music is universal. So it's like any kind of um, cultural background, I guess um, it has a, like a huge power to for people. Right? 
So yeah, I look forward to let's join uh, Monique's uh, session on the um, 12th of September. So we can continue our discussion. It will be really nice. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tanya. I think we've replied to everyone's question. Please hands up if I, I missed something or if anybody has a final question or comment for Tanya. And if not, I'm going to hand back to Amalia. Yes, I think it's really nice open discussions about music. Thank you, Eva. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Monique. And we will have like, we will have a back to back sessions about music. And I think it's like never ending discussions about music because Indonesia has a lot of variety of cultures and divers and, of, and that's including music. And this is, we just talk about Gamelan Bali. Yeah. And then we have 200. 32, yeah, 232 um, um, instruments and from Sumatra to Papua and what is the kolintang between gamelan? Actually, I went, when I was like, it's different. But when I'm thinking like, oh yeah, it's almost the same with, mm -mm -mm, yeah, you, 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 what you call? Um, uh, but one is from maybe bamboo and the one maybe it's from metal or I, I don't know, but that, that's the thing that, oh yeah, it's, it's, it, it sounds simple, but it's not. Indonesia is really um, diverse. And yeah, we are coming to the end. So I think we can wrap here and, and uh, don't leave everybody because we have some information and also photo group is important. Um, pardon my background, suddenly there is a uh, rain and thunder in the back in the Netherlands as usual Monique and Eva so the one in Indonesia enjoy your nice weather we are having a nice weather for the last two weeks I guess and too hot actually and suddenly usually it's like thunder going uh, uh, when it's uh, ended anyway so I will share uh, maybe before I will take a picture first and then I will share you some information. Um, yes, I want to say hi to a good friends from Indonesia, Jakarta, Geneva, um, Groningen, the Netherlands, Bekasi, and also our um, young volunteers. We have Alzheimer Indonesia young volunteers here who is attending also. So let's take a pictures. I will get my uh, thing. When the one who's not the video on, Febri, Kata Mbalesti, and Fatia, maybe you will have your video on because we are going to take a pictures now. Moment. Moment. Not yet. Yes. Okay. Here. One, two, three. Bye. One more, one more. Just to, oh, not yet. Just to be sure, just to be sure, just to be sure. One, two, three. Yeah, and hello, Oma Lalita with the colorings. Wow. Oma, Oma Lalita is our, what is it? Um, um, loyal, uh, yeah, participant, people with dementia here every time she's enjoying um, the crowd of Zoom. Oh, ini Oma hits, yeah, hits banget nih. And she already like colorings for more than 140, ya, yeah, Novia, yeah? around that, 140. 150 yeah, and she's um, starting when like this kind of sessions we have a we have um, actually in the first day at uh, the first days of pandemic we have coloring sessions together and Oma Lalita is enjoying uh, no participating on the sessions and then since then she's not stopping until now it's her favorite hobby and treatment and everything yeah, Oma, <laughs> enjoy. We keep it. Oh, that's the latest masterpiece of Oma Lalita. 
<laughs> Yay! Okay, so I will share a bit of our next um, sessions. Um, yeah, so like I uh, mentioned, we are entering September and September is a World Alzheimer Month. So you can expect everywhere across the world will be about will be talk about dementia so, um, on the September um, uh, we will have uh, many of activities too and then we start with Monique Monique is all, also here it is uh, we have a break for around one week two weeks usually we have every week because we want to have a preparations on the 12th September music therapy from the elderly from the former Dutch Indies because you know the connections between the Netherlands and Indonesia is really really close so we will have a talk about it and discussion about it please share to your Dutch friends or Dutch friends or anything who interested in it uh, I think I have to mute okay okay it's mute now and also on the Alzheimer day itself it's on Monday, so it's not on Saturday. It's on Monday, uh, 21st of September. We will share the best practice in dementia care from Indonesia and the Netherlands. So now we have, uh, like you know, we have a twinning program. We have a good relationship between the Netherlands and Indonesia. Alzheimer Netherlands, Alzheimer Indonesia. We are exchanging uh, informations, activities, and everything together. And on the Monday, 21st of September, we will share from both sides what is the best practice from the best of the world with D.Y. Suharia, founder. Um, she's not here, but she just told me that she is streaming from Facebook. Hello, D.Y. and also Professor Mira Fernoy and Professor Siti Setiadi and also from Alzheimer Netherlands, Indonesian Embassy. And in between, we will have Indonesian dances, hopefully, and maybe hopefully for Gamelan from Bali too, yeah, Dania. And yeah. And don't forget, we still also have, oh, sorry, it's going back. Yeah, so this is, don't forget, save the date. Uh, the next uh, session is still on the 12th September, but Alzheimer Indonesia and other chapter will have a lot of activity too, um, because it's online, so we can access from everywhere now. Um, the detail of the World Alzheimer Month uh, activity, you can uh, follow in uh, Alzheimer Indonesia Instagram and any Alzheimer Indonesia chapters. Uh, they are updated also with the, um, the activity. But from us, uh, this is our next sessions with Monique and also with the moderator, um, uh, Dr. Manik, uh, as a moderator. And yeah. So, okay, we have uh, all, uh, all the online stores if you want to support and you want to have something from our, like, you know, like we, we wear now, some of us wearing the shirt and also maybe mask. And yeah, we have the photo group already. So, don't forget to um, enjoy also the, our um, JMDP, Jangan Maklum Dengan Pikun Challenge, if you see now in the WhatsApp group and the social media. It's happening a lot now, so hopefully if you want to send us your activity, your dances, your um, hobbies or anything, you can send us and join the, or tag us and join the challenge. So, thank you very much. You can unmute yourself now and we dance together. Um, Eva, thank you very much from Bali. Dutch in Bali and Indonesians in the Netherlands. <laughs> we exchanging. We are diaspora in both sides. No, <laughs> and I'm Tania, thank you very much. Yeah, hey, I'm from Germany. You know, <laughs> you <Yeah>. are. <laughs> well, I, I, li I live just across the border, oh, uh, yeah, like yeah, no. ten kilometers away from the Netherlands. But I am in Germany. <laughs> It's like you, you, your right side or your right foot in the Germany and your left foot in the Netherlands. It can be happen here. Yes. <laughs> and we have Oasi from Geneva, everybody from Jakarta, Bekasi, Oma Lalita, um, Katuti, Mariam, everybody is here and also students, volunteers, Sindhu, Henny. Thank you very much. See you on the online WhatsApp group.
12 September on Monique Sessions ya. Thank you Kak Amalia. See you. Siapa bilang pikun itu biasa saja Siapa bilang pikun itu tak berbahaya Jangan malu dengan pikun, jangan malu dengan pikun Hati-hatilah Bila sudah mulai lupa, bingung tidak fokus Marah-marah curiga yang berlebihan Thank you, Kak. Bye. 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 Bye